Provincetown, then and now. We rely on a variety of resources to inform us about our history, our heritage. There's our schooling, of course, and books, textbooks, nonfiction, and even historical fiction. They all help us to understand our past. Film is also an important contributor, and when that film is accompanied by narrative from the people who were there, then, well, that provides an invaluable resource. Here is the story of a Provincetown fisherman, Peter Cook. This film was made by Peter when he was a fisherman in Provincetown in the late 1970s. The first section was actually filmed by Peter's father in the 50s when he too was a fisherman here. Fishing in Provincetown was once its principal industry and made it one of the wealthiest communities in the Commonwealth. Those days are now past, but this film offers the opportunity to experience life as a fisherman as it was then, but no longer is now. In a moment, Peter will speak to us about this film and we'll get the chance to learn a bit about what life was like back then in Provincetown. Not just about his experience as a fisherman, but also how life has changed in this magical place. We had our own Provincetown marching band and Yvonne Cabral that owns the P-Town trolley was the majorette. She was just a little thing strutting down the street with a baton leading the band. See the parade going by, you also see a woman in one of the cars, the parade, and that was actually my grandmother, Viola Cook. And she came here from the Azor Islands to uh, match up with my grandfather uh, in a made marriage that was made in the old country. So they did it in those days. You also see a lot of servicemen. Of course, we had the United States Coast Guard, and we also had uh, the United States Air Force men from North Toro Air Force Station. We also had Navy men because we had different naval ships in Provincetown from time to time. There was a little pan of the harbor and there was a battleship Macon you could see out in the distance. A lot of men would come in and march in our parades. This great film is really a compilation of film. It was shot over decades of time. My brother, Joseph L. Cook, grew up in Provincetown, born and raised. He shot some of the film. Because you actually see me in a little boat riding with my friend Frank Sheik Rosa and another friend, buddies, riding around an outboard motorboat. That's what kids did in Provincetown when you grew up here. You spent as much time as the water on the water as you did on the land. I think we were pot fish, really. My father, Joseph G. Cook, was born in Provincetown. He took some of these moving films. And of course, so did I. I guess we handed that little box camera around from hand to hand over the years, and we shot what we could see, our own little town. That all leads up to me becoming a fisherman one day. Dad, I want to go fishing. Fishing? Man doesn't go fishing because he wants to go fishing. Man goes fishing because he has to go fishing. No, Dad, I've talked to you about this many times before. You've always advised me to stay ashore and work steady because I had a trade, being a mechanic and a steady job. <clears throat> but right now, Dad, I want to go to sea. You want to go to sea? What boat you going on? This is a conversation I had with my dad many, many times. But this particular time is about to take a little different turn. A different tact, as we say. We stood in my dad's front door looking out at Provincetown Harbor and we could see this beautiful boat, blue and white, painted up nice, with a high pilot house and a high bow, sitting out on the mooring. It had been there all summer, waiting for Captain Gerald Costa to finish his summer work of whale watching with his whale watch boat, the Ranger. And then he was going to take this boat and go scalloping for the winter. It was an offshore scalp. I said, Dad, I want to go on that boat right out there. He said, that boat? He says, that's a Harvey's, Harvey Gamage boat. He said, that was built up in Maine by a man named Harvey Gamage. That's a good sea boat. He said, who's the skipper? I said, the skipper's Captain Gerald Costa. He said, Captain Gerald Costa, he's a good skipper. 
He knows how to handle the boat. He said, what's the arrangements? I said, well, I go as a cutter. If I cut a bucket, a 10-quart bucket of scallops, shuck, as we call it now as fishermen, shuck a bucket of scallops, I get $10. He says, oh. He says, you don't know how to shuck a scallop. I said, nobody told me he'd teach me if I wanted to go. He's bringing extra men just to work as cutters. He said, well, that's a good arrangement. He says, you're going to need uh, oil gear and boots. You've got to get a lot of things together. You've got to have a few hats. You're going to lose a few out there. And I thought this was a little different conversation that I ever had with my dad before. Unbeknownst to me, I was getting his blessings to go offshore for a number of years with Captain Gerald Costa on a little infant. It takes a lot of grub to feed a gang when you're going out to sea for two weeks. Thirteen to sixteen men. The truckloads of food would come down from the local market. A.M.P. I suppose at the time. And the gang would help the cook to bring all the stores aboard, the provisions, and put them away. In this film you see some of the people that are still around. Victor Peters and Eddie Schmidt and Johnny Peters and Tony Avalon and a young Mike Moko Medeiros and the late Peter Cadero, all pitching in and giving a hand, all hands working to put the grub away. And so many thoughts go through my mind, and so many times I sat with my dad and talked about fishing before I ever even went to sea. He used to tell me about the food. He worked in stores and he knew food, and he worked as cooks when he went on boats. And he used to say, make sure that you Eat the chicken up first. Don't eat the chicken after you've been out a while. It'll spoil quick. You have no refrigeration on that boat. You only have ice. You have an ice box. The stores that are put down in the fish hole will keep for a long time. Milk will keep for over a week if you bury it properly in the ice. And he says a lot of that stuff will keep good, but some will spoil. So don't eat roast beef and sandwich meat and things like that after you've been out a few days, because it'll spoil quick. And Dad was right. And towards the end of the trip, of course, even before the end of the trip, we'd be drinking milk with chocolate fa flavor and with strawberry flavor just to take the curse off, the turn of the milk. We ate very good. We ate steaks and we ate chops and we ate roasts and we ate meatloafs and we ate spaghetti and scallops and lobster. We ate so much scallops, scallops were in everything. Lobster every day. Lobster uh, salad for sandwiches, you'd find lobster in your grub all the time. When we catch lobsters, we'd just break off the claws and the tails and throw them in a bucket and leave them for the cook. And he'd cook up the, the claws and the tails and he'd open the meat, so we always had fresh lobster every day. Maybe that's why I don't care so much about going out and buying lobster today. I ate so much of it all my life. But anyways, Dad, he knew a lot about food. When he was 15 years old, he went to work for Bert Perry down at Perry's Market, down at the foot of our street in the west end of town, down off of Mechanic Street where we grew up. He grew up on Creek Road, that's where his old homestead was. And in 1945, the year that I was born, he bought the house that I live in at 21 Mechanic Street. Dad worked before he even had a job at Bert Perry's. He worked with his grandma, for my grandmother, his mom. And when he was just a little boy, he would take a wheelbarrow and go and pick up laundry. My grandmother would take in laundry in Washington, and fold and iron laundry for, for the local people in town. He would take a wheelbarrow and go out and get a wheelbarrow full of laundry and bring it back for his mother to wash and prepare for folks. And then he would go and deliver it. For his work, he made a, he made a nickel a week. He got a nickel for his work. But he didn't actually get the nickel. The nickel went to the household to help support the family of nine kids. And my grandfather died when my dad was 15. That's when he went to work at Perry's Market because he had to really help out. But as a child pushing that wheelbarrow and making that nickel, I remember my Aunt Ruth, who's still with us today, telling me this story more than 20 times about how my dad would get an egg for his work 
for pushing that wheelbarrow back and forth around town. He needed the egg with his dinner because he needed the strength to work. And she was just a little girl, his little sister, so she didn't get an egg. So he would share that egg with her. Usually he'd open it up and give her the yolk. He says he didn't like the yolks, but I watched him eat a lot of eggs in my lifetime and he ate a lot of yolks and never complained about them. But anyways, that's all part of the story because we grew up tough, we grew up hard, we grew up poor. My grandfather stepped aboard that whaler. I have no idea how long he was out to sea, but those whalers would go out oh, a year or so at a time sometimes. Commercial fishermen, when they went out of Provincetown cod fishing on Georges and on the Grand Banks, would be gone months at a time. Salt they catch and come back from the ocean. Sometimes they didn't come back from the ocean. But anyways, we had a lot of men on our little boat, the little infant. She was 90 odd feet long. It would sleep uh, 13 men, had eight bunks up forward, had four bunks back aft behind the engine room, and it had one bunk up on the top of the pilot house behind the wheelhouse for the skipper. So we had eight, we had 13 bunks, 13 men, but sometimes we'd bring extra cutters. So uh, we had extra bunks that we built up in the whale back. That's where I thought I was going to sleep when I started out. I pictured myself as I was building the bunks up there for Captain Gerald Costa that I would be sleeping in one of them. But I was fortunate when I got aboard. Gerald and Wayne saw that I got a bunk down behind the engine. Slept right behind the engine room. It was noisy. Couldn't talk down there. With the blare of that 550 horsepower caterpillar. But it was stable down there in the stern of the boat, and I had my own bunk. Pretty privileged for just a cutter to be aboard. As I said before, unbeknownst to me, I was in the making to become an engineer, and they wanted me near that motor so I could hear any little thing that went wrong. If something was uh, abnormal, I would wake right up, and I'd go and check it. I caught a lot of things before they happened. So anyways, that's another little part of this story. Dad went on to tell me more about fishing and more about boats and that particular boat than I ever would know in my lifetime. Dad fished offshore, going out for 10 days to two weeks at a time on, on the Flyer One and on other draggers. He knew what the life was like. We would work 14 days at sea and come in for three. Go back to sea for 14, come in for three. That's the way the little infant operated all year round, summer and winter. That was all ahead of me, and I don't want to get ahead of my story. So my dad says, let's go down the wharf. So we took a ride down the wharf. We saw Captain Costa and talked to him a little bit, because dad knew him very well. We all grew up in Provincetown. We're all brothers, really. We're all family. And he gave me my blessings to go. He told me a couple of things at that time. He says, I'm gonna tell you a few things, my boy, before you ever go fishing. He said, for one thing, you're gonna get sick. And there's no shame in a man getting sick when he goes out to sea, but you never stop working. You never go lay in the bunk. You continue to work. If you throw up, throw up over the rail. But don't stop working. He said, and when that boat leaves the dock, you be on it. He says, there's no reason in the world for that boat to ever leave the dock and you not be on it. If you have a disagreement with the captain or you find out that you don't like it, it's not suitable to you, you don't have an argument. You simply, when you get to the dock, you never quit at sea. When you get to the dock, you simply have a talk with him. You get your gear together, you say, Captain, thank you very much for trying me out. I don't think it's suitable to me. Maybe another time. You leave them on good terms, because you never know if you might have to go back there. And all these captains know each other. And if you ever want to go to sea again, you don't want one speaking ill of you. You want them all on your side. So this was the beginning of my time at sea. And go to sea I did. I worked very hard and very long hours. And I went to sea 14 days at a time and came in for three. After I was on the boat for a while, I brought my little camera. I had a little 8mm box camera and I could shoot some film. 
And that's exactly what I did. When I was on my off watch, I took movie pictures. Some of the movie pictures you're enjoying today, and I certainly hope you're enjoying them. I shot film when I was on my off watch. When we started out on the boat, we worked six hours on, six hours off. On your six hours on, you worked on deck. You ran the gear. You shucked the scallops. On your six hours off, you had your bunk time, but you also had to eat, and you had to wash, and you had to relax, and you had to have a smoke, and you had to do the things that you had to do before you could get just a few hours sleep. That was a standard watch. I worked six in the morning till noontime. I worked six at night to midnight. That was on the captain's watch. The mate's watch worked noon at noontime to six at night, and they worked from midnight to six in the morning. If we were real busy with scallops, the captain would break the watch. He'd tell the mate, get a hold of the boys and tell them we're going to be working eight and three. That's eight hours on deck. Oh, well, excuse me, eight and four. That was our eight and four watch. Eight hours on deck and four hours off. Eight hours on deck, four hours off. And if we were really ass deep in them, ass deep in the scallops as we say, we'd pull a nine and three. Nine hours on, three hours off. Nine hours on, three hours off. That was no picnic. It was the hardest work I ever did. You didn't know if it was day or night. You didn't know if you were going down the galley to eat breakfast or supper. You didn't know if you was on foot or horseback. But one thing you did know, you were out at sea on the little infant with Captain Gerald Costa. Captain Gerald Costa ran the boat all during the winter time. Come summertime, Captain George Adams took over, another province town, very heroic fisherman. And Captain Adams would hire a Wolfley crew. I started out as a cutter for ten dollars a bucket, as I started to say in the beginning of my story, but I slowly worked my way up the ranks. I always wanted to become a crew member. It's a natural course to take when you go to sea on a boat. So I would ask the skipper, when can I be crew? He says, as soon as you learn how to shuck those scallops and you get as fast as the guy who's a crew member and you can stand beside him and pull your weight, I'll put you on his crew. Mr. Costa was a man of his word and that's exactly what he did. I became a crew member. In all my time, in my spare time, uh, Gerald Costa would say to Wayne, his nephew, he'd say, Wayne, take Peter down the engine room. Hey, Wayne, teach Peter how to pump the boat. I was a mechanic all my life. I went to trade school, Provincetown Vocational High School, learned how to do my mechanic in, worked on automobiles, trucks, boats, marine engines, and I learned it pretty good. I spent quite a few years in the trade. When I went to sea, all I wanted to be was a fisherman. I wasn't thinking back about being a mechanic. But when Gerald Costa saw me come up to him and ask him if I could go fishing with him, he didn't see a fisherman, he saw a mechanic. <laughs> all, all fishermen are mechanics. Well, not all, but ones that own the boats are, and the first mate's usually pretty good at it. And Wayne was the first mate. He was, ran a lot of Gerald's boats, and Wayne also was the engineer. And Gerald realized that he had an engineer in the making when he put me aboard that vessel. And over the years, I became the engineer. I was the guy that pumped the boat and took care of all the lights and the wiring and the equipment and the winches and every single thing, mechanical thing that had to do with that boat. That was me, Peter Cook, the engineer. As I became known to my crew members, we all get nicknames as we go out to sea, and I don't know why I got this one. I became Peter san Everyone on the boat called me Peter san Many years after I was fishing, one day I ran into a fuller up in Wolfley, Froggy Frazier, who fished with us years ago. And this was maybe 20 years later, 25 or more years later, and I hear this voice hollering over to me, Hey, Peter san Hey, Peter san I said, wow, I haven't heard that for a long time. Calling me by my name that I had at sea, Peter San. Anyways, I did my time fishing. We got some film that I shot 
As I said, I would shoot the film on my off watch, on my time off. So most of the men that you see in the film are the guys that work on the opposite watch of me. The captain likes to set out in the dark and make his first tow at daylight. That's usually the richest, fullest tow, the way they start the day. The first couple of minutes into this film, some interesting comparisons, how things change, but how things stay the same. Probably in the 50s, Mr. Flyer Santo Sr., the owner of Flyer's Boatyard at the time, salvaged a big fishing dragger, named it the Flyer One, and it had come aground off of Wood Inn. He salvaged it, took it to his shipyard, and worked on it on the railways. He made it ready for sea, fitted it out. And he hired himself a captain and crew, and that was a trip boat, dragger fishing for fin fish. My father worked on that boat as the engineer, <laughs> going out for a couple of weeks at a time. And you can see some of the film that he did, some of the men that he fished with. I don't remember all their names, but Clarence Serpa was there. I saw him and Anthony Joseph. Anthony Joseph's still around with us in Provincetown. And then it flashed right over to me and my crew, the little infant, many years later, in the 70s. But still, there's the boat, the little infant. We were going for shellfish, but we were doing the same thing. We were fishermen, and we were fishing. We were fishing weeks at a time. We were on highliner boats. Sometimes the seas were so big, it would take the pilot house windows right out, and wash things right off the deck. Sometimes you were in seas like mountains. But anyways, that was all part of the trip. It was all part of the work. It was all part of the fun. But the boys, they had fun. They worked hard. That was the name of the game. Scallops. Scalloping. We liked it. We loved it. We hated it. The romance ends when you leave the dock. That's the way it is, the life of a fisherman. Dead Captain General Costa, if you didn't like the way he did things on his boat, if you said anything to him or questioned him and said, you don't like it here on my boat, go buy your own boat. Get your own boat. Get your own crew. Go do it the way you want to do it. This is my boat. As long as you're on here, you're going to do it the way I tell you to do it. I'm the captain. Well, that's what you did. All he wants to see is, pardon me, but assholes and elbows. He don't want to see you kneeling down on deck. He don't want to see you standing around shooting the breeze. But here's the boys. They're in the shucking house. And they're on the deck. And they're working their asses off. Six hours on, six hours off. Maybe eight hours on, four hours off. Whatever the captain decides, that's what you're going to do. Sometimes you see the boys have made a scrap for themselves out of a piece of rope. They take a couple of rings, and they cut a section out of the rings, and they hook themselves to the table. If you hook yourself to the table, it's a little easier on your legs when it's rough. It takes the strain off of standing at that table for hours on end, opening scallops. And a lot of fellas did it. Especially if you had a heavy roll of sea, you didn't have to have your legs spread apart. Sometimes I would take a box and put one foot up on a box to relieve my back. But I was standing next to an old timer, and it was Richard Dickey. He never used a strap, never used hooks. Never strapped himself to the table. And I asked him one day, I said, why don't you make yourself up a, a rope and some straps? and hook his help to the table like the rest of the guys. He said, you ever see one of these shucking houses go floating by in the water? And I knew that was when it wasn't such a good idea to be hooked to the table in the rough weather. If the sea took the shucking house off, you went with it, you didn't stand a chance.
Each man goes to sea with his own thoughts and his own mind. We all have to say our goodbyes to our wives, girlfriends, kids, parents, family. We have to leave behind <clears throat> that life when we go out to sea. Because we take our worries with us, and soon enough we get busy, we have to take care of the task at hand. So with goodbye kisses and waves and hugs, we leave Provincetown Harbor, and we look back. <clears throat> when we look back, we look back at a place that you can't get to from here. We look back at a big fishing fleet. Bygone days, no big fishing draggers left anymore. We call them draggers because they actually dragged their nets behind the boats. They could be dragging a net that's weighted down to drag the bottom for bottom fish, flounder, that sort. They could have a midwater trawl, as we call it, in the kitchen, butterfish, codfish, whiting, so many different species of fish. Those were draggers. That was an otter trawl, as they called it. We were scalloping. But as we cleared the pier <clears throat> and we looked back, it was not the pier that you see in Provincetown today. It was our old pier. There was a big two-story building made out of cement blocks that the town leased that to a man named George Cawley, and George controlled the waterfront. He was a monopoly. He set the price. You got what he paid you. You didn't have any alternative. Later on in years, they became a co-op. When we come in and land our fish, or our scallops in this particular film, we'll unload at the co-op. The co-op was created by the fishermen, so that they could have a little more say in their shipping and the prices. But clearing the breakwater and rounding Long Point, we see the lighthouse on the very tip of the point, the tip of Cape Cod. We make the corner and head down towards Wood End. Long points to green light on the very tip of the point. And as you go down by the wood end, that's a red light. You make that corner and turn to starboard, and you make it what we call the Northwest Bend, and you head it out to Race Point. And you clear Race Point Lighthouse, and you head it out into the open sea, North Atlantic. Fishermen always left for uh, the sea at strange times. I remember when I was a boy, a very young boy, there was a castle in the west end of town up across from the province town inn that was owned by the Murchisons. Oh yes, it was a castle, all right. And it caught fire. And there was a tremendously huge fire in province town and everybody was going up there. There was the wee hours of the morning, as we call it. And the fire was, was quite spectacular, but what I really noticed for the first time in my life as a boy was I heard these sounds going on down in the harbor at 2 o'clock in the morning. I heard these little engines start up. I learned later they're called Lister engines, uh, popcorn engines, or auxiliary engines. They were small motors that started up on these fishing dragons. And then sometimes they would pump up air pressure so they could start the main engines. And next thing you know, I heard main engines starting up. And I'm looking down, I'm not watching that fire, I'm walking up to the west end, but I'm looking out at the harbor, and I'm watching these fishing boats go out. And as a young boy, I was totally fascinated by that. As my life went on, I didn't, as a young child, go fishing. I did go with friends of mine that fished for their dads. I went with David Perry on the Plymouth Bell, and we'd go and take fish out at the canal and things of that sort. But to actually go to sea, I was a young man by the time I got to sea. So anyhow, I was fascinated by that sound. And here we are now headed out into the North Atlantic Ocean. The goosefish, well he's a deadly fish. Big mouth, a lot of teeth. Sometimes they're buried in the pile and the scallops are right in the goosefish's mouth. You reach in to grab a shell, unbeknownst to yourself, you put your hand in the goosefish mouth. He closes up on your hand, your glove. You can't pull it out, 
because his teeth are razor sharp, pointing in backwards. So what are you going to do? You're going to step on his bottom lip with your boot, the toe of your boot. You're going to reach down with your thumb and your finger, uh, put his uh, eye sockets, make a pretty good handle, and pull up on his head and slip your glove out, your hand out. If you yank it out, you're going to cut it. My grandfather was a commercial fisherman by trade, but he didn't come here on a fishing boat per se, he came here on a whaling ship from San Miguel Island, the great island of Portugal. He took a sight a job on a whaling ship and he worked his way over on the ship as a ship's cook. He had no money to pay for passage. Like all others, he wanted to get to America, so he worked on that ship for who knows how long as a ship's cook. When he left Portugal, his name was Manuel Forres, or Frias, as they say. And when he got here, everybody said, who's that guy? Well, that's Manny the Cook. Well, Manny the Cook, Manny the Cook, wound up taking the cook name for the rest of his life. That's how we cookies wound up being here. Not very often that you have a flat, calm, bright, sunny day and mild weather on George's banks, but it does happen. This particular day, you watch the boys having a little fun on the deck, playing hopscotch. This was really a spoof on the skipper. Don Fry was the one doing the hopping <laughs> and the hopscotch. And Eddie Schmidt and Wayne Costa and Skip Albanese are doing the looking on and the coaxing. We had been out hunting, hunting for scallops. An average tow is about 30 minutes. A little less if you're filling the dredge up to the sweep chain with scallops, you have to tow a little shorter. Because you won't get them all in the dredge. A little longer if you're not catching so many. But when you're hunting, the tow is 10 minutes. Haul back, set out, tow for 10 minutes. Haul back, set out, tow for 10 minutes. You're on the hunt. This particular day, we weren't catching any scallops. We hadn't been catching any scallops since we started out, really. And the gang was kind of standing around with nothing to do, which is unusual. And they said, uh, hey, Pitasan, go down the engine room and get a steel marking chalk. I didn't know why, and they marked out the hopscotch. And they started playing hopscotch on deck. And this particular day, Captain George Adams had the boat. i never forget his response. He hung his head out the window, and he says, Well, I'll be goddamned. I've seen a lot of things on George's banks, but i never seen grown fishermen playing hopscotch on the deck of a boat. <laughs> well... I think the gang was playing a little spoof on the skipper. That's how it went that particular day. Going out to sea, coming back into Provincetown Harbor, you have to cross the steamer lane. There's a shipping lane. You see freighters, tankers, big ships, military ships, they all run down the steamer lane. When we go over it on the way out, we go over it on the way back. Sometimes with Gerald Costa, we fished in the steamer lane. That was a little tricky. <clears throat> Had to be in spots in between where the shipping was going north and the shipping was going south. I never liked it too much, fishing in the steamer lanes. Dangerous business. But anyhow, that was one area where we had to be careful. We almost got run down one night by a big oil tanker. Those ships run along pretty good, and it takes them a long time to stop. They run about 30 knots traveling, 
and it takes them three miles to stop and it takes them four miles to actually back up or go astern. So when they see a small boat, by the time they see us and get right up on us, it's, it's too late. Sometimes you get hit. Some of them, some boats have been rammed and sunk. Some friends of mine were on a boat that got hit, the boat sunk, and their lives were spared, they were rescued. So you had to be careful in the steamer lane, that's for sure. One night I woke to some blaring of horns and went up on deck. There's a big, big ship coming down on us and the mate had the wheel and he woke the captain and the captain turned the boat in the nick of time. He just missed us. He looked over at me and he said, Pedro, you gotta be careful out here. If you see you're gonna have a little problem, you gotta give him a small target. Turn the ship, give him a side, tur side target so you get a glancing blow. You have a chance. He said, don't let him ram you. You're a goner. George knew what he was talking about. He was a good skipper. He's still with us. He's down in Florida. He's got a big house down in Boca Raton. He doesn't come up here anymore. He's too far advanced in years. Gerald just left us. Passed away not long ago. The old timers are going. The old timers are gone. I look around, I don't see any old timers. One of my friends said to me one day, when you look around and you don't see any time, any old timers, guess what, you're it. I guess that's kind of true. The white beard, certainly not a young guy anymore. <laughs> but you had to be careful in the steamer lanes. Clearing the deck of scallops not an easy task. It's all done by hand. You place the bushel basket between your knees, you bend over, and you pick those scallops up as fast as you can, both hands. You fill that basket up, you bring it in, dump it in the shucking box. A cutting table. Then you have to open them all. <clears throat> you can go down to a hardware store and buy a shucking knife or a lot of guys will make their own out of just a common table knife, like what we would call a butter knife or a dinner knife. Grind the blade the shape they want it and tape up the handle with friction tape. And soon enough, after you've opened plenty of scallops, that handle will mold right to your hand. As soon as you pick it up, you know it's your knife. Your hand knows that knife. The old timers would teach you how to make them. Grind them out on a grinding wheel down the engine room. Tape them up with friction tape. Plastic electrical tape's no good. Doesn't stand up in the water. It's gotta be friction tape. Once you get your knife made, you're ready to go to work. Experienced men will have probably several different knives they've made and used for different sized scallops. Peanuts, a smaller blade, mediums, a little bigger, and of course large, bigger knife. But all made relatively with the same curve to the blade. The blade curves, narrows down as it gets towards the handle. Because you have to pick up the scallop. If you're right-handed, you pick it up with your left hand. You hold the curved side in the palm of your hand. There's a little slot down by the hinge and you slip your shucking knife in there. And you give a little twist to your wrist and you scrape the top blade. You scrape the blade against the top shell. And you're actually severing the scallop from the shell. That half. And you slip the knife out. And you slip it back in again. And the next time you grab the gut of the scallop with the blade of the knife and you hold it with a little pressure against that shell, top shell, which is really the bottom shell, but you've got the scallop upside down, top shell, you kind of rip it off, and with a flick of your wrist, you fling the gut and the shell out the window. And you're left with the curved part of the scallop shell in your left hand, with the scallop meat or eyes still in it. Then with a flick of the blade, off it goes into the bucket, you throw the other shell out. You can probably open 50 scallops just while I'm telling you this little story when you're good at it. 
<laughs> but anyhow, that's how it's done. You see the boys doing it. Every once in a while, of course, you get going so fast, you throw the knife overboard by accident. So it's good to have a spare. Every now and then, while you're shucking, you're in a rhythm, you're going like hell, the captain will walk up beside you and he'll grab the top shell out of your hand just when you get ready to flick it overboard. He'll take a look at it. He's looking for a little wafer of meat left on the shell. And if there's a little wafer of meat, you're going to hear about it from him. Hey, you're not doing that right. Look at all the meat you're leaving on there. That all adds up, you know. Take all those shells, you scrape all that meat off. Look how much money you're throwing overboard. You gotta have a clean shell. Scrape it clean. Hey, show him how to do it. Show these guys how to do this so they're not throwing the meats overboard. Well, that's what you're gonna hear. So you wanna get good at it. And when you get good at it, he doesn't have to come look at your shell anymore because he knows you know what you're doing. He knows you're worth your weight. Once your time gets pretty cold, chucking him. Get a little frostbite once in a while. Uh, and it, you get what's called a grip. Sometimes when you're shucking scallops for 12 hours or more in the day, sometimes 18 hours if you're working a nine and three, when you wake up, you can't move your hand. You can't bend your wrist. You can't even pick up a piece of paper. It hurts so much and it's so stiff. But that's good enough for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then you work it out, because you got to go back to work. Chances are you're not going to be able to say, hey, uh, Captain Costa, I got the grip, but I'm not going to be able to work today. <laughs> that just doesn't happen. I was lucky because I was down in the engine room. In the back of the engine, there was a rail around it, a handrail. When I'd get up, wake up to get called to go on watch, I'd stand for a couple of minutes holding on to that rail, which was nice and warm. And I could feel the heat going through my hands to loosen them up a little so I could button the buttons on my shirt so I could get my oil gear on. My fingers would move because it'd be pretty stiff when I wake up. When the guys were bagging up in the winter time, bagging up the scallops, their hands would freeze. So the cook would come up out of the galley with a pan of hot water steaming. They'd put their frozen hands into the hot water pan and let them thaw out a little bit, go back to work. There's no sympathy on a boat. Pain you endure. Bone chips, part of the business. Aches and pains, soreness, sickness, sometimes plum old misery is all part of the business. You learn to live with it. Now you see the men working. You see something a little bit unusual, shell stocking. Most of the time we cut all the scallops, we brought them all in bagged up. But when we were catching so many, so much of a bounty of scallops, we would dump the scallops down through the bunker plate and down into the pins or bins in the fish hole, shell stocking. And when it's rough, it's a good idea to have weight down in the fish hold of the boat to make it more stable. So we'd load the underside of the deck up with scallops, plus we'd be cutting and bagging the whole time too. But we'd have so many, we'd have the whole boat loaded inside. We'd come home with a whole deck loaded in burlap bags full, all inside the shucking houses and up on the whale back and in the stern. And we'd come in and we'd go to the town pier and all the town's people, whole bunch of people, cutters would be waiting for us to come out and we'd go to the dock and pick them up and there was a big, big deal going on in Provincetown. Biggest thing at the time in the winter, chance to make some money. You wonder why we do this kind of work. You wonder why these men will go out there and risk their lives. Work harder than hard. Work like hell. Live, live in hell sometimes. 14 days at a time out there. It's money. It's money for a lot of them. Gerald used to say when we came into port, go spend your money, go spend your money, go to Hyannis, go buy a TV, go buy a car, go spend it. He wanted you to spend your money because he knew if you had money, you'd never go out there. You may hear me refer to the rake 
or the dredge. That's the apparatus that we tow behind the boat. We let out the one inch wire and we drag the rake along the bottom. It dredges the bottom. So we call it both things, a rake or a dredge. The forward part of it is called the bale that everything else is attached to. The bale has a pressure plate. So as it's dragged along in the water in the bottom of the ocean, the pressure plate holds it down, pushes it down to the bottom. Weighs about a ton anyway, but it'll bounce along the bottom unless it's properly made. It has a sweep chain that sweeps along the bottom and sweeps up the scallops, and the bag is made out of steel rings and links. The very tail end of the bag is a bar and a chain called a tag chain and a dumping bar used to turn it upside down and shake the scallops out on the deck. These rakes, this is the business end of this boat. This is how they dredge up the bounty, the booty. And you see the action taking place soon enough. The dredges are coming in, the dredges are going out. After we get into a rhythm and we're out there day in, day out, 24 hours a day, hauling back and setting out every 30 minutes, we can bring those dredges aboard, empty them out, and send them back out again in about eight minutes. Any longer than that, George Adams got his head out that window of that pile house saying, Hey boys, ten minutes there, shorten it up. Pulling them aboard and dumping them out is making money. It's a little bit about the dredge. Now here you see him in action. The boys are bringing him aboard. Fishing is a competition. What happens is you have one whole watch and one crew working against the other crew. The boat works for 24 hours a day. It never stops fishing. It sets out the rakes, as you see in the film, tows them generally for half an hour, hauls them back, and dumps them on deck. You may stop working when you steam or you travel from one place to the other to find a better spot, but most of the time, it's 24 seven. The rakes are going in, the rakes are coming up, the scallops are being cut. Not easy work, very, very difficult work. So you have two crews, and you got two guys on one side of the boat in one shotgun house, generally, and two guys, crew members, in the other side in the other shotgun house, whittling away at the scallops, shucking the scallops. You are trying to beat the guy next to you. You two guys are trying to beat the other two guys on the other side of the boat to cut the most scallops and to dump the most buckets into the scallop washer stainless steel container and your watch is trying to beat the other watch when you come up and you do your change of the watch at noon time or midnight you always hear tossed around the deck hey how many bags you put down oh we put down 17 oh we're going to do 18 oh, how many bags you put down we put down six we're going to do twice that and there was a constant competition that's what it was all about everybody stepped up Everybody did their very best. Everybody worked their very, very hardest. And I think that we all worked very well as a team, as a crew, and we uh, went to sea with Gerald. And he always brought us home. We came home in some horrendous storms. Scallops are washed with the salt water from the deck hose. They go in the stainless steel washer. We have a shovel that actually has holes in the shovel just to use as a big paddle to wash and wash and wash the scallops. They're washed and washed so clean with that salt water. Then you have two guys to bag them up. One guy holds the bag, cloth bag, special bags. The other guy will take a bucket, dump it in, take a second bucket, dump it in, and it takes two buckets to the bag. The 
bag weighs 40 pounds when it's full. There's a certain way to fold that bag. And the bags have to be tight. And that slime off of the scallops is very slippery. And in the winter time, it's very cold. You can't use gloves. Tony Avalon was an excellent folder of the bag. He could fold that thing just perfect. And then Don Fry would put the wire on it with a hand twister. And he'd twist the wire all up tight. And you could pick that bag up and set it in those wooden fish boxes and put a half a dozen of them in a box and then you'd hand them down. They'd be rinsed and rinsed and rinsed all the time. You'd hand them down to the hold man. And he had a sacred job down there. He had to make sure they weren't going to spoil. Everybody worked at that to get those scallops down below deck. And you try to do this as quickly as you could because you do it at the change of the watch. So you have six men on deck and six men down below and you're finishing up and they're coming up to get dressed in their oil gear to go on watch and you're trying to get all the scallops off the deck and down in the fish hole and you're trying to make this change as quickly as possible and you try to do it without the gear coming aboard. to see and catching a lot of scallops like we're doing here, even though we had all the electronic gear we had, Gerald liked to make a buoy. So he would take a few cans and he would take a long pole and get some rope and put a flag on and everybody said, what the heck is he doing? He's making a buoy. He's making a marker. Put some chain on it to weight it down. So during the daytime he could keep coming up on that buoy and make a turn around it and steam back away from it and He's catching scallops, and you can see he knew how to do it. If he used a plotter machine or if he had x-ray vision or made a buoy, who cared? He was catching them. Everybody's got to get their boots and their oil gear on to get ready to go to work. I remember talking to my dad before I went to sea, and he says, uh, you got to buy boots. And I said, yeah, I know, Dad. He says, well, get channel boots, steel toe, and get the shop boots come up to your knee. Make sure you buy them two sizes too big. I said, geez, why do I want to do that, buy them two sizes too big? He said, well, he says, you know, because when you go overboard, you want to be able to kick them off. He says, they're not so easy to be able to swim when you got boots on. You fill up with water, they'll suck you down. So every once in a while, the old man got my attention with little stories like that. And of course, we caught our share of rocks. Sometimes we would add a lot of extra chains, horizontal and vertical chain, to the open part of the dredge because we'd be going over so many rocks. And other times we'd just catch them in the dredge and pile them all up on deck and then steam off the tow, get away from where we're actually fishing and throw all the rocks overboard so we wouldn't keep catching them over and over. Probably build a lot of little mountain ranges out there out of all the rocks that we caught. And when you're putting what Jerry used to call, Captain Costner, I should say, when uh, he was putting the big ones over, he'd call them Jeep size, as big as a Jeep. And you can see in some of our footage, the boys have got a hold of some big rocks and have to be careful, you don't want them to roll down on your foot or run over your leg, and break your leg out there. No uh, 911, yeah, you could call the Coast Guard, but it took them a while to get there. 
Oh, if you got hurt bad enough, they'd come out with a helicopter and airlift you off of there, but never had that happen with me. Oh, with my men that were out there, we did get hurt, but, uh, you know, broken finger, uh, sprained wrist, or a broken rib, but uh, toothache, but Gerald never brought you home. He stayed out there till, at least till the end of the trip, and if you had to take the next trip off, you could, but when you're 200 miles offshore, and a couple of days steam to get home, you break a finger, well, if you're lucky, the cook will make a splint for it, and, and you're just going to suffer it out. Not a nice thing to say, but it's pretty funny when somebody got hurt on a boat. It wasn't really funny, but we had to make light of it. And uh, so anyways, that's a little bit about the uh, washing and the bagging of the scallops. And these boys were excellent at it. And if a, bar, if a bag popped open down there in the fish holes, it dropped down a wire twister and a wire. Somebody would go down and help the whole man and it button it all up nice and bury it all up in the ice because the first bag we put down would come out of that boat last and it had to be just as fresh as the last bag we put down. And I never ever came in with a trip of scallops that we had scallops that were spoiled. Every now and then the fish buyer would cut the bag open on the dock, run his hand into it and take a whiff. How do you check seafood? with your nose. <laughs> That's how you check scallops. Unfortunately, we always had good ones. <laughs> we had deck loads rail to rail, and I can hear the skipper now. Oh, Gerald. Make more room, make more room. Push him, push him, push him in, push him in. We gotta keep towing, we gotta keep towing. Faster, faster, come on, faster. And it was all competition, like I told you before. You fast. You worked as fast as you could to keep up with the guy next to you, and he was working to to do you guys to keep up with the guys on the other side of the boat. It was all competition. We were young guys, and it was hard work, and that's what we were there for. Working for a share on a boat. It varies from captain to captain and boat to boat. A boat, most boats, it's 50-50 split. Boat takes half, the crew takes half. But on Gerald's boat, it was more of a 60 40 split. 60 for the boat, 40 for the crew. Because we were still doing pretty good. And then the fish, if we didn't have a huge amount, we whacked up the fish. We shared up the fish and sold it, and that was spending money for the crew, a little cash. So you'd make 12. 13, 14, 15, 1600 dollars a trip for your two weeks out, and you'd get three or four hundred dollars cash in your pocket for the shack money. Didn't have to tell your wife about that. If you caught an abundance of fish, the fish went into the stock, and you'd earn your money that way. We did okay. We did well for the day. Back in the day, 78, 79, it was pretty good money. For me, it wasn't all about the money. It was about going to sea. It was about growing up in Provincetown, a fish town, a fishing village, when a lot of men were fishermen. Fishermen usually have more than one trade. They can fish, they're good seamen, the Portuguese heritage, the Portuguese ruled the sea, the Portuguese taught Christopher Columbus how to sail, the Portuguese were catching codfish over here before the pilgrims even poked their nose around this Cape Cod. So it's in the blood. Grandfather, fisherman. Father, fisherman. Me, fisherman. My father worked ashore too. Me, cutter by trade, worked in the stores. Me, worked ashore as a mechanic, auto and marine mechanic. Fell back on my school and in my trade all my life. It was a good thing that I went to trade school. A lot of fishermen are machine operators, bulldozers, 
excavators, they're truck drivers, they're carpenters, they can build a house, they can build a deck on your house. They're uh, tradesmen, they're electricians. Uh, they can do anything. And it has to be that way. Sometimes the fishing's not that good. Sometimes it's lucrative. And when it's good, everybody wants to get on a boat. And when it's bad, you stay ashore and work. You gotta make some kind of a steady paycheck to get by. So that's a little bit about the fisherman's life as well. Some people spend their whole life at it. Guys that I fished with years ago are still fishing. The old timers wish they could be fishing. Just the way it is. How can you explain the life? I don't really know. All I can say is, it's in the blood. I'm glad I did it. And I could never understand how a person could grow up in Provincetown, so far out to sea, with so many boats going in and out, and never really going offshore to experience what you're seeing today. And this is Scallopin. We also have a lot of dragons. They do the same thing, but they're dragging nets and they're catching fin fish. But a fisherman is a fisherman. Anytime you get towards the end of a trip, the last 48 hours, everybody gets what you call channel fever. You can't sleep. You don't sleep very good on a boat anyway. You get a kink, little naps, but you can't sleep solid, not for any length of time. So, you play cards, shoot the breeze down the galley, Last couple of days, you know, you're going in, kind of step, get your gear together, getting your thoughts together. Start talking about all the money you made, how many bags you got, 500 bags. If you got 500 bags, you got a pretty good trip. 20,000 pounds of scallops all washed and put down, put away. You know, you're going to make some money, so you start spending it in your mind, talking to each other of all the things you're going to buy. Of course, by the time you get home and the wolf gets his share, you don't have a heck of a lot left. But it's certainly fun spending that money, in your mind anyway. Remember my dad telling me a funny thing about a fisherman. He says, you always think you're going to get rich, but you never ever do. Sometimes you think you're going to starve, but you never ever do. It's kind of an in-between like everything else kind of get by. Well, when the gang's getting ready to go home, you're chucking a few scallops for yourself to take home. Maybe take a little coffee can to a friend or something like that. Cleaning up some fish, maybe some flounder. You might have a catfish you want to take home. Make some catfish in your dials. But that's channel fever. And that's what you get the last 48 hours. When you finally start steaming for home, you feel pretty good. When you see a lighthouse, be it Nosset Light or Highland Light or East Point Light, it feels pretty good. When you're coming in, rounding the wood in, rounding Long Point, looking at Provincetown, coming across the harbor, really, you feel like a million bucks. You didn't make a million dollars, but you went out and you done something. You done something that a lot of people have never done. That's just a little bit about channel fever coming home. Well, the co-op the co was, was a, a renegade outfit from, uh, from Province on the Fishermen that, that wanted to get a fair price for fish. That all started around fair pricing. We had one fish buyer, and it was his price or no price. 
So we, uh, we got together and uh, started the Provincetown Fishermen's Co-op. We made a lot of errors and a lot of goals in, in, the, in the time span that it ran. Gerald, Captain Gerald Costa, he was a member of the Board of Directors. The Board of Directors was a member, was 13 fishermen. We thought we'd have more fishermen in the Board of Directors because some were at sea and some weren't. We all were pretty happy with the, with the setup. It was a fair, a fair trucker came in and gave us a fair price on the, on the shipping of the fish and the co-op took its reasonable amount of cut from the price of the fish and it all stayed that way. As long as the, the, the fish were being shipped to Boston, New York, or New Bedford, or any kind of a, of a processing plant, the, the fishermen themselves felt they were getting a square deal. And that, that's the basis of the whole organization. It was to get a square deal on, on the fish that we worked so hard for. The boats out of Provincetown, the day boats as I call them, they would go out to 3, 4 o'clock in the morning to fish for the day and come in at night. The time they left depended on where they were going to go. As I say, they don't travel very fast, even under steam. So, if they're going to fish off a race point and they're leaving the dock in Provincetown Harbor, it's going to take them about an hour to get there. If they're going to fish down around what we call the back side of the Cape, the outside of the Cape, down by the highland, down off of Pickett Hill, it's going to take them a couple of hours to get down there. If they're going to fish down off of Nosset, or down towards Chatham, it's going to take them four or five hours to get down there. Now this, of course, was all before the National Marine Fisheries came in and re-regulated the fishing, young small fishing boats out of business. This was when a man could go fishing when he wanted to go fishing, where he wanted to go fishing, stay as long as he wanted to fish. Day boats out of Provincetown sometimes stayed out two or three days. If they were on good fishing and the price was good, They've been laid up in the harbor for a week or two because of a Holland Nor'wester, and they finally got a chance to go out. Go out, they did. They went out and they fished and could fill their boats up. Didn't tell them how many pounds of fish you could catch or what species you could catch. Today, if they give, a, they give somebody a quota to catch 50 pounds of fluke, they have to throw all the haddock and they have to throw all the codfish and they have to throw everything else to dead back over to the crabs to try to get their 50 pounds of fluke. It's crazy. It's really crazy, government regulations. But I'm not here to tell you about that. I'm here to talk about fishing when fishing was fishing. And the man could go where he wanted to go and do what he wanted to do. We did fish off of Canada all the way up on the northern edge of George's Banks and over the years fished all the way down off the coast of Virginia. Different trips at different times. And George Adams and Gerald Costa they knew George's Banks. Of course, George Adams spent so much time on George's Banks, he figured that they named the bank after him. I think he believed it in his heart. He was George Adams and that was George's Banks. Kind of funny. There was one story George Adams, Captain George Adams, told me many times. We're fishing on the little infant and he called me up to the wheelhouse, did it more than once. And he'd look at the sounding machine and he'd point at it. And he'd say, <clears throat> Here's where I sunk the Maria and Julia, my boy. So what do you mean, George? He said, Well, he said it was foggy, and the weather was sloppy. He said, didn't have any rate out of those days, I had the captain bill. He says, and I had some of the boys with me and getting ready to set out. Start throttling up. He says, the next thing you know, I run right into the side of a big beam trawler out of Boston, the Marie and Julia. Put a gaping hole in the side. My brother Dick was with me. He went down across the deck of the Captain Bill and put his hand up on the mast. He says, back it down, George. He said, but as I started back down, the Marie and Julia's taking water. In the meantime, this guy's climbing over on the bow of our boat. This guy's uh, jumped in the water. They're climbing up the rakes. They were hanging over the sides of the rails because we got ready to set out. My crew's trying to bring everybody aboard. He said, so I had a hold over the nose of the Captain Bill in the side of the Marie and Julia long enough to get all the men and the skipper aboard. And then I backed out and I let her go down. 
is where she is right in this spot on the bottom. And he told me that story many, many times. There's a lot more to the story and it took me many years to learn the full context of it. But the people in Provincetown had heard no communication the way they got it nowadays. They had heard that the Captain Bill went down with all hands. Truth of the matter was that Captain Bill came in with its own crew and with the captain and the crew of the Marie and Julia. Brought them all the way into Provincetown. Captain George Adams saved all those men. Oh, there was a court in Boston. Some of my friends were there. Listened to the whole trial. We ruled an accident at sea. They wanted the captain of the Marie and Julia to testify against Captain Adams, but he said, you know, this man saved my life and he saved the life of my crew. It was an accident at sea. Heavy fog, hard weather, and those things happened. But that was the sinking of the Marie and Julia, a story I heard from Captain Adams many, many times. Another bit of a story about a sinking is the Leland J. But George Adams and I were both there for this one. It was my off watch about two o'clock in the morning and I'm sleeping my quarters down behind that big caterpillar engine. And my shipmate, my dory mate, Rick Lindholm, came down and woke me up. I felt the shake, opened my eyes, because down there in that engine room, we can't hear each other talking. It's mostly lip reading and sign language, but he was telling me he was anxious for me to go up into the wheelhouse, that the skipper wanted to see me. And I would say it was a little roly-poly. I would say it's probably blowing about 70 miles an hour. And we got 40-foot swells and 30-foot seas breaking. And it's a little difficult getting my gear on heading up there to the wheelhouse. But I got up there, and uh, George Adams says, There's a boat sinking over here, Pedro. I can see the lights, and I want you to keep an eye on her. He says the last radio broadcast I got was that she was the Leland J. There were six men. They were going to be in the water. He says, I don't know if they're going to be swimming. I hope not. If they're going to be in a raft or what the situation is. But I want you to keep a lookout over there on those lights. Well, every once in a while, she'd come up on the crest of the waves and I could see the lights, and then she'd go down out of sight. When the skipper got the May Day, the boat was seven miles away. We were the only boat out there besides them. And the last radio broadcast that Captain Adams had was, there were six men there were gonna be in the water. Yeah, Coast Guard radio was blaring. U.S. Coast Guard, United States Coast Guard calling the fishing vessel Little Infant. What's the location of your vessel? And George was trying to deal with them and he was trying to steer our boat. I would say it was rough as a son of a bitch. Most men would. But to George, he'd say it was a little sloppy. Anyways, I get up to the wheelhouse and I see all of our guys on deck. Two of our guys in survival suits. The only two survival suits we had on board. Coils of rope, flashlights, life jackets, not knowing what to expect. Some men up on the bow. And old John Ocosta was up there, old Eagle Eye, and he spotted a little green light every once in a while. It's a little chemical light they used in sword fishing kids use them to play with because they glow in the dark. Sword fishermen use them. And these guys in a raft were using them for a signaling device. One was moving back and forth and one was held steady. You could only see them when the raft came up on the crest and when it went down in the trough they were out of sight. George is jogging up towards them with a little infant. The wind's blowing towards us and next thing you know 
John O'Costa says they're heading right for underneath the front of our boat, going under the bow, and he's screaming, Back it down, George, back it down. Old George Adams steps out of the pilot house with his legs spread to stabilize himself and adjust his glasses, and he says there'll be no hollering on this vessel. He said, Bring him around on the leeward side and put him down. In other words, bring him aboard and put him down below. Well, old George put that little infant in reverse and throttled it up. See a big black charge come out of the stack. And those guys down in that raft were petrified. We got them alongside the leeward side and got a rope to them. And every time that raft went down, they'd go out of sight. And every time it went up, it would go up higher than the gallus. And one by one, we yanked those guys out of the raft. All six of them dropped them on our deck. We even hauled the raft aboard. And the Coast Guard never showed up. Too far out to sea. Things happening too quick. We steamed all the way back to Chatham with those guys. Because they stopped our fishing for that night. And... We chucked scallops all the way to Chatham. And when I asked the engineer on that boat what happened, he said, well, we only had a Lister engine, artillery engine for pumps, and they had 90,000 pounds of fish aboard. The whole man in the sea story. Some scallops and some lobsters. And the Lister engine got an oil leak. When he got to the last five gallons of oil he had feeding that little listener engine, the engine seized up, and he knew they were a goner. But that was the sinking of the Leland J. Last time I saw her, she was bottoms up. And I know I'll never see her again. Little fish story. Busy night for George Adams and the crew of the little infant that night. And then see it on TV, Never even read about it in the paper, but I was there for that one. Captain Ralph Andrews is the one that moved the life-saving station that's on the barge that we see in this film. He, Captain David Dutra, moved it around to the race with the Petro, with the Josephine G that was Anthony Jackett's boat, and David Dutra was involved, Captain David Dutra. And here we are looking at this picture now of the life-saving station. The water was flat calm in the, in the, in the, in the storage site, but out at Race Point, the wind was blowing 30, 30 or 40 knots, and the weather was feather white. So I said, well, let's go take a look at the drop site. And Chrissy had some bulldozers out there digging this big pit. And we were going to slide this thing right up in just like it was a small boat in a, in a small lake. Just I told him, I said, you know, the way this is going right now, I said, you're going to heat a lot of houses in Provincetown with a lot of wood. He finally saw that the conditions were not advantageous to do it before spring of 1979. You're going to see a couple of the crew members going up onto the pilot house of the little infant when we came in in a terrible storm. And they were tying up a um, flag, an American flag, attaching it to one of the stay wires on the rigging of the aftermast. And that was uh, in memory of the Captain Bill fishing boat that had gone down. My father on the Captain Bill, he sailed the morning after the storm. Everything was uh, ship shape on the boat. But some event, some catastrophic event, uh, between the time he left and when we first realized he was missing, uh, some catastrophic event happened, and the, the ship was was not responding at all to radio contact or, or anyone seeing her on, on the way or, or, or a fishing operation. So we all kind of felt in the family that, that things had gone bad. And in the course of time, we, we had the Coast Guard and, and the, all of the uh, necessary resources looking for the Captain Bill, and it was never found. It was never found floating. Um, a short time later, a, a ship captain named Joe Roderick on a, on a vessel ship, Jimmy Boy, he um, he hung up on a, on a wreck that was not, not there before. And um, in hanging up on that wreck, uh, my uncle called me and uh, 
said that Joe, Joe's on a wreck that's not, that's not on the charts and it's not in, in his memory. So we, we kind of knew it was the Captain Bill and we got some forces together that evening. He stayed on the wreck. He stayed hung up on the wreck. I asked him not to. I asked him not to make any more tragedy out of tragedy that's already transpired. But Joe hung up on the wreck and he stayed on it for that whole night. Stayed hung up with, with bad weather. And then during the evening, I, I called up another friend, Anthony Jacket, with the fishing vessel Plymouth Bell, and we put together a dive team from Woods Hole, and we got that, 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 that dive team out to the, to the site where Joe Roderick was. And uh, here I am talking to you almost on the anniversary of, of, the, of the event. It's, it is February 2012. And uh, I can see some of my uh, some of my recall is getting a little cloudy, but it's pretty clear that, that when the divers came up and said it was the Captain Bill, that I uh, I felt the, the deepest of remorse for myself and my family and the crew members' families. There was a lot of tragedy on this. As strange as circumstances might happen, it was another fisherman's friend. His name was Kevin Ferreira. He was fishing on the Triumph. One year later. Eight miles from the wreck, one bone was, uh, was brought in. And that one bone was a, a bone from my father. That bone had, a, had a, a broken segment on it, and it matched the forensics at Cape Cod Hospital, and it was the only bone we read from the tragic event. Uh, that was the destiny of fishing. You can leave, but you don't necessarily have to come back, and that's how you live when you live by the sea. And the captain, Bill, went down February 9th, 1978. The captain was Captain Ralph Andrews and the crew, Ernest Tasha, Edward Horning, and Robert Sullivan. The boat rolled over on the backside and was lost. So when we came in from the storm and the trip, we were putting the flag up in memory of those men. Part of this is sort of a homage to the Provincetown fishermen that were lost at sea. During my time of fishing over the years, we lost several boats in Provincetown. The Patricia Marie went down October 24, 1976. Went down in a storm, and went down with all hands, went down with a load of scallops in the fish hold and on deck. Captain William King was a skipper. Maurice Joseph was aboard. Elton Joseph, Walter Marshall, Richard Olenquist, Robert Zawalik, Ernest Cadero, all good Provincetown men, Provincetown born boys, raised in Provincetown, going to sea. They that go down to the sea in ships. The Captain and Bill we mentioned, and another boat that went down in 1984 was the fission vessel Victory II, May 8, 1984. Captain Kenneth R. Makara, Benjamin Fernandes, and John J.D. Dorf also went down to the sea. So part of this film, my heart is a homage to these men. I'm going to take a break now. One of the most dangerous things fishing in cold weather ocean is getting ice built up on the rigging. When you have sloppy seas and you get a stiff breeze and the temperature's down below freezing, you start to make ice. The ice collects up on the on the gear, on the rigging, the mast, the booms, powerhouse winch, the top of the boat. And the problem is the boat gets top heavy. Bad situation. I've seen times when we were fishing when we had to stop many times to break the ice, throw the ice back overboard, wash the deck down with the deck hose, use wooden mallets. Couldn't really use hand walls or sledgehammers because the metal sticks in the ice. Rather to have a mallet like a croquet mallet or a baseball bat breaks the ice even better. I'll tell you one thing, when you get a message from the skipper and he says, call the gang to come up and break ice, Nobody drags their feet on that one. They come up out of the forecastle in a big hurry. Start getting rid of that ice. Also, when you're steaming, 
you're towing, you got bad weather, you don't have too many men on deck unless it's real necessary. The sloppy weather you see here with the ice making up on the, on the rigging, you see Captain Gerald Costa has the boat, Wayne Costa, his nephew, real man's man. Everybody loved Captain Costa and everybody loved Wayne. Wayne's out there, he's the engineer and he's working on the gear. It's always work to do on the boat. Johnny Peters, good deckhand, good man, always ready to lend a hand. Out there helping Wayne. The gang's down below, waiting to hear the bell. The bell will call him up on deck. These guys are adjusting the cargo hoist and doing the maintenance on the winch and doing the things between tows or between steaming from one spot to another, doing things that had to be done. You're fixing lights, you're greasing blocks, you're always doing something on a boat. A boat is work. I remember John Peters saying one thing about a boat, everything's heavy. Everything you have to pick up is heavy. Everything you have to do is hard. It's all hard work. But that's what we're there for. That's why we're out there on the high seas, to do hard work, to keep the ice off of the boat, off of the deck, and to come back home safely. Fortunately for us, we did exactly that. Some boats weren't so lucky. On February 21, 1960, I was a week shy of my 16th birthday. My brother Joe was already 21. And on this particular time, day, the Monica Smith, a big freighter of the Swedish Chicago lines, was caught in a big gale, a hell of a gale, in a big high coast tides. And the skipper was trying to make the head of the race and he missed a corner and driven in that windy, ran her up on the beach. And when the tide went out, she was high and dry. You could walk all the way around her. And that's just what thousands of tourists did. And they came down that Washington birthday weekend, and they walked a mile or so down the beach to go see that freight. It was quite a sight, sitting right upright in the sand. and sat there for a week. I didn't have to walk down there from the new beach, what we call Heron Cove today, because my brother Joe and his friends were going to go down there and go scuba diving down around that boat. So he gave me a ride. And he gave me a ride because he wanted me to be holding that camera, taking some movie pictures. Took pictures of the ride along and took pictures of the ship sitting there in the sand and took pictures of my brother Joe, and I was proud to do it too. There he was standing, leaning against that big ship. It was a lot of fun. I like my brother Joe, and I love him today. I always wanted to be like him. I could measure up. Anyway, they got that ship off by digging a big trench with a bulldozer. They got two big ocean-going tugs and waited for a high course tide, and they tugged her off of there. And it was okay. It was set free because a boat parked on the sand isn't very much good to anybody, is it? In the 50s, when my dad was fishing on the Flyer One, a lot of the boats fished right amongst the Russian fleet and you see the Russian fleet, factory ships and trawlers in this film. They could fish within the 200 mile limit. And our local fishing boats and the Russians fished in the same areas. There was no problem with that. They got along. There was no cold war going on out there off the coast of Cape Cod on the fishing grounds. And they were allowed to fish in there until 1975 when Congressman Jerry Studs, through an act of Congress, passed the 200 mile international limit so that foreign vessels of all sorts had to stay outside fishing vessels of the 200 mile limit. In a way it protected our areas for our local fishing boats. The fishermen that I knew that fished amongst the Russians, although the ships were very huge, the factory ships and the trawlers, they were no threat. 
quite the contrary. They were helpful. When the weather was very bad at night, they would make a breakwater. And if the local boat stopped fishing for the night because the weather was too hard, the big ships would make a lee for them, would make a breakwater. And I was told this story by my good friend Richard Dickey and by other fishermen that fished back in those days, that they got along, they helped each other out. In 1980, Captain George Adams complimented me by asking me to go to Louisiana and pick up the Barber Lee. The Barber Lee was a 110-foot steel Alaskan king crabber built brand new by a couple of Cajun brothers and a crew down there in Thibodeau. I went down with George and his son Gio and Rick Lynn Allman, Paul Merzen, and we went down and got the Barber Lee and brought it up to Provincetown. It was built 45 miles up the bayou. We fished out of Province Town with it all summer. And we're out on a trip a couple hundred miles offshore as usual when the captain called me up to the bridge. He said, Pedro, your dad passed away. He says, all I can tell you is most men would stay out here and finish the trip. But if you want to go in, I'll take you. I said, well, Captain Adams, if I can make the funeral, my family will all be there. I'd like to go. He says, take the wheel, gave me a course to set. And he went down, talked to the men, and left me up in the bridge for a couple of hours, Stephen. I'm thinking. I was thinking of my dad telling me, well, my boy, if you're going to go fishing, go fishing. And when that boat leaves the dock, you'll be on it. And I never missed a trip on the little infant, not a one. And I never missed a trip on the Barber Lee. I steamed home, and I made the funeral. But I lost my appetite for offshore fishing. Finished up the season on that boat. And that was the end of trip fishing for me. The boat went off to Alaska, and my wife decided it wouldn't be a good idea for me to go to Alaska at the time. A couple of young children at home. And... So I stayed going on the day boats. But to be honest with you, things were never the same. My friend, Ralph Andrews, young Ralph Andrews, and his wife Jane and I, as we reviewed the film, we're watching footage that my dad filmed when he was fishing on the Flyer 1, the fishing vessel Flyer 1. Now Flyer Santos, who owned the boat yard, had salvaged that vessel off the beach, named it Flyer 1 after himself. Francis Santos, really, but they called him Flyer because he ran everywhere and he ran very fast. He flew. And the name Flyer stuck with him all of his life until today in his older years. And as Ralph and I were watching film that my dad shot, footage of the deck of the Flyer One, Ralph, he said, hey, there's my dad, that guy right there in the hat. That's my father. And we began to recollect. And Ralph, he said, yeah, so Flyer wasn't a fishing boat captain, so he needed a skipper, and he hired Ralph Andrews Sr., Ralphie's dad, to run the boat. And there's my dad serving on the boat as the cook and the engineer, doing two jobs. So here we are, at our age now, looking at film that was shot perhaps in the 50s of the Flyer One, and both of our fathers fishing on the same boat. Is it a coincidence, or is it the life of a fisherman in a small town, growing up in a fishing village? As I said before, we're all brothers of a sort. We're fishermen. We're family. Captain George Adams always called me Pedro. 
From the time I stepped aboard the boat to go fishing with him, that was my nickname with him. I explained before how the crew called me Pizza-san. Not knowing where the name came from, it set well with him and set well with me too. But with George, I was Pedro. If I saw him today, I'm sure he would call me Pedro. He wouldn't call me Pete, he wouldn't call me Peter. He wouldn't call me Cookie. Those are a lot of names I'm known by. But to George, I was Pedro. If you notice my email address someday, if you write to me, it's going to be Pedro. Pedro Frizz. Name I would have had in Portugal, perhaps. Thank you.